Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Tilo from Parashift. Um, I will give you a talk today on, on how Parashift is using uh, GCP uh, to solve document extraction. Um, probably that, uh, that topic should normally be presented by our CTO, but uh, he couldn't make it. Uh, so we asked our CEO who couldn't make it. So we asked our head of machine learning who's on vacation. And so, well, basically today you're stuck with me, a person from the business. I got like all the information I need, hopefully, but if the questions afterwards in the tech talk go too deep, I most certainly will not be able to help you. But I, I hope I have some, some nice graphics to show um, how we scaled and did the architecture and use all the Google services in the back um, to give you uh, all the insights you need. So Parashift. Um, Parashift uh, was um, founded uh, when our CEO and CTO, they were searching for a plug and play document extraction API. So they tried to, to extract some basic data like uh, the vendor or um, uh, total amount, line item, stuff like that uh, from an invoice. And they thought this, this problem is, is, is age old and there's more than enough OCR solutions on the market. So they'll just buy one and plug it into their accounting service they were building up in another startup, and they'll just go. Um, yeah, the, the bad thing was uh, they didn't find any OCR service that was actually matching their needs. Like there were this classical legacy OCR solutions which you had to install on premise, uh, put in a lot of consulting work to get it up and running. And, and then put more consulting work in until you get a halfway satisfying extraction rates. And they said, yeah, well, uh, that, that, that should be a lot easier. They want this plug and play document extraction API. So um, since they only had one startup at the time, they just founded the next startup and that's basically us. Today, our vision looks a little bit different, uh, we want to um, create a platform um, for document extraction, but also classification, um, which is super accurate, fully autonomous, and, and almost free. So get the human out of the loop. If you have an invoice, if you have a contract, if you have a correspondence, you want to upload it somewhere, and you just get the data back in a structured format, and you don't have to, to see if, if you need to correct anything. It, it just works out of the box. Like, that's what we are working towards. We are not there yet. otherwise. Um, we would be a little bit bigger, but yeah, that's more or less uh, our vision. So uh, Parashift, we are a team of 25. We are situated uh, near Basel, uh, as I said, founded uh, in 2018. Uh, we have a lot of machine learning engineers and developers. So um, with me, you've got the head of business development, but to be honest, like I'm the only person in my department. So. Uh, not much of a head there, but yeah, we, we, we take the money we have and the resources we have to, to really um, create our technology and, and, and go further with it. Because we believe that if we deliver a great technology, if we deliver a great product, it's, it's way better than having like 20 salespeople. What is enterprise content management? I, I just want to, to get you all on the same page. So basically with, with enterprise content management, um, classically, it's, it's, it's mailroom solutions. You get a lot of uh, inbox, email, post, uh, emails, all kind of documents. Uh, you have accounts payable with this classical process where you want to um, extract data from an invoice, automatically book it, have a, a workflow for people to, to, um, to check and, and validate it and stuff like that. So basically, ECM, most of the times it has, it has these three components. It has the input and capturing part where you receive new documents and you need to classify them. What are the documents? And based on this classification, you need to extract the most important data. Um, then you have some workflow a lot of the times. You need to work with the classified um, document and with the data you extracted, uh, you need to either automatically book it or you have a human interact with the data, something like that. And then in the classical sense, you, you have the storage or the archive where you archive a document for a certain period of time where the ERP system and other system can access it and where you can maybe also perform like uh, data analytics based on the document data and all the stuff on that. And uh, what I want you to understand is like, 
this is not always a linear process. A lot of the time you, you capture it, you directly archive it, you give it into a workflow, maybe it's moved into another. But like in a classical sense, it's input, workflow, and archive. And the better you perform the input and capturing part, the more data you get structured automatically, the easier it is to automate the workflow and the storage. If you capture all the data here correctly, you can automate the workflow, you can automate the storage, you don't need human inter interaction in these two anymore. So our goal is to, to make life in, in this area a lot easier for, for all businesses, for every developer who just wants to maybe develop a cool app and thinks, ah, now I need one freaking document from a customer, how to get the data out of it. And then he has to start using machine learning and he has to set up something himself and he just thinks why or oh God, why is not a very simpler solution to just extract a little data from a document. I mean, if it's a form, yeah, like very structured, that's easy, but I'm, I'm talking unstructured data that, or documents that come in a little bit different every time and you need to set up so many rules and it's just annoying. So um, how are we doing it? Um, or at this point, I just want to give you one quick peek into the application so that you just understand what is happening. Just uh, 30 seconds and afterwards, maybe everything will be clearer. So um, when I'm talking about classification, extraction, everything, I'm talking about you have a document like a correspondence. The machine knows that it's a correspondence based on how many other correspondence it has it has processed in the past, it knows what to look for in a correspondence, so it classified it as a correspondence. And you have certain fields and data that you want stru structured out of this, uh, out of this uh, correspondence. For example, here, you would like to get the sender who sent the correspondence, but you would also like to get the receiver who, who actually receives the correspondence, and then maybe some general information like the subject um, or the date uh, or a contract number. So basically, this is like 15 seconds presentation, that's it. That's everything you want. And to get there, um, what we are doing is like um, uh, four different steps. First, if we receive a new document, we have some, some pre-processing with the image we have to do. So uh, clean up lonely pixels, uh, disqueue it, uh, uh, see that it's not rotated 90% or 180 uh, degrees, so it's standing on top. Um, of course, we need to do, like, all the software, what I'm describing here, generally speaking, a lot of, of people out there call it OCR software. They, they are not, say, they don't mean the OCR engine. Everyone in here most likely will know the difference between OCR engine and what we are doing, but business people say OCR software, and they mean everything. But in this pre-processing step, we actually do the OCR, uh, also like ICR, reading out barcodes, layout. Lot. So we gather all the ground information we can get from the image and from the document, be it a PDF or whatever, um, to later perform our tasks uh, in a proper way, like first step. Um, then we have uh, separation. So customers, a lot of the times, so they, uh, they upload 20 pages and the first three are an invoice, the next three are a delivery note, the next five are something different. And so you need to find the, the beginning and end of the documents and automatically separate the documents. This, by the way, is not yet in the platform. I'm just showing it because we will do it. Um, but it, it's an important part uh, in, this, in this whole setup. Um, also, if you look at the workflow from a customer point of view, sometimes they have these the scanners and they don't want to scan each document, say scan, document, scan. They want to take the whole batch, put it on a scanner and scan it. Uh, afterwards, as I said, classification, what kind of document is it? And then the extraction of text fields, dates, amounts, addresses. Uh, you want to maybe interpret certain sentences and uh, find uh, cancellation um, information out of, of sentences or whole text blocks. Uh, tables, detect signatures, stuff like that. And basically, like, this is the hardest part of, of everything in here, um, from our point of view, of course. Uh, so uh, this is where actually where we put in all the brain and, and what I will show you later on, how we automatically train on this, how the architecture is built uh, towards 
doing this. Which challenges did we face? Uh, so when we developed the, 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 the platform first, we started locally, but at, at some point we decided to, to create a product, create a new startup and, and, and scale it. And the challenges we faced was one resources. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen something like this or something like this. Like this is a freaking expensive piece of hardware uh, that's able to scan 730 pages per minute. It's a scan street. And big companies have oftentimes multiple of these. So what they do, they get all the, the, the inbox, the post, and there's still a lot of paper around. They get it in the morning, 5 o'clock, because they have special contracts with Swiss Post to get it extra early. They get it at 5, and they use these scanners in two hours to scan everything. These don't run the whole day. It's about speed. You want your documents in your system as fast as possible so your workflows can start as fast as possible. So what does that mean from our point of view? There's like in the whole Switzerland, there's like a time frame between five and let's say nine o'clock where we suddenly get a, a freaking huge amount of documents all at once. And we need to do pre-processing. We need to do all the data extraction and classification. And after this time frame, it's, it's just going down again. So. Um, if you have an on-premise installation, what you do or what you did like a couple of years ago when cloud and everything wasn't, uh, if you were working with VMware and stuff, uh, you tried to give the, the machine doing the OCR and everything, you tried to give it enough resources that it was working fast, but not too much because it was laying idle the rest of the day. And you had certain documents with higher priority which needed to be fastened, all this kind of stuff. And if we go in the cloud, if we are a cool startup, you can't say your document is now being processed 10 minutes. You have to wait 10 minutes until you can, can see results. We, we block certain use cases. We just, it, yeah, yeah. Like we, we need to have scalability up and down in the back. Challenge one. Challenge two, uh, compliance, data protection, and security. Um, a lot of local governments uh, or, or organizations like the EU or the US or whatever, they, they have special law in place to, to for, for all that. I mean, I don't have to tell you about data protection and stuff. But with documents, of course, there is a lot of the time the sensitive data on there. And as soon as this data leaves certain country borders, imaginary country borders, it gets a problem. And in the sales process, you uh, are stuck half a year with some compliance department talking about nitty gritty details. So if we want to scale this platform, this product worldwide, we would need a provider or, or something where we can just scale it into new compliance zones, into new countries and just say, okay, you want your data only stored in the European Union? No problem, we'll set up a data center there. You want it in Switzerland? No problem, we set it up. Um, Challenge number three is the complexity of the whole business. Like, as I said, we started with invoices because every OCR software is starting with invoices. Invoices are freaking boring, but it's the one use case really every company has and the one step into and say, hey, come on, let's work. We'll start with the invoices and afterwards we'll do lots more. And a lot of the times you stop after the invoices because the company has their mind already somewhere else, but we started with invoices. Um, so, but now we wanted to go further. We have delivery nodes, uh, which are very similar. You have kind of the same data. Like this is not all the data we extract. It's just a, an excerpt, an example. Like on a delivery note, on an invoice, you need the sender, the vendor, the invoice date, invoice number, maybe total amounts. On a delivery note, you have exactly the same. You need the vendor, but the delivery note date and the delivery note number. And most of the times you don't have total amounts. Um, so this is something you could standardize. An invoice, every company has invoices. Everyone needs the same data out of it. You, you could standardize that. That's what the little s and our little parashift symbol should indicate. Delivery note, we could standardize that as well. Correspondence, we could standardize that as well. Just the four fields I showed you, like sender, receiver, subject, date. And if they want something special, they should be able to do that too. For example, here's a document type that I don't know what company wants to extract data from, an eye color inspection report, where, where they also need the sender, the document date, some total amounts, the eye color of the person filling it out. I don't know why, but they want it. It's on the document. They want it extracted and the name of the patient. So 
as you can see, like there, there's again, there's similarities to the correspondence delivery note and invoice, but like also some crazy shit that we couldn't possibly put into uh, into our standard for. So we we searched for a way to to solve this complexity to be able to to serve customers who just want invoices, delivery note, and correspondence, but also serve a customer that that wants something special, and. I can tell you firsthand, I mean, I tried to sell it without this and it, it didn't work. Like customers were saying, yeah, it's cool that you can process invoices, but I want this. I want one field more on an invoice. I'm a very special customer. On my invoice, I want this. Or I have a very special form. If I already use you, I have this one vendor policy. So if I get a vendor for OCR, you also have to do this. So we adapted and well, I told you our vision, we, we wanted to go here as well. But this complexity, we, we knew that we had to tackle it one way or the other. And that's basically like the solution for these was for us, yeah, let's go to the cloud. Like, I mean, it, it wasn't a discussion. It was always, of course, we would go to the cloud. We are a startup founded 2018. We wouldn't de deliver an on-premise solution. But um, it, it helped us with the resources. We could scale up and down in the back like we wanted to. And I will show you in the architecture. Um, it, it helped us, or actually the, the solution wasn't only the cloud, but it was especially Google for, for compliance, data protection, and security with different compliance zones. We, were, we are now in a position to easily deploy into another compliance zone. And if a customer should, should want it, we can go elsewhere and also like, they, they have a Swiss compliance zone, which is great. Um, and challenge free, the complexity, we were able to tackle that as well in the cloud. It didn't, it, the cloud is not the solution to, to solve this, but it, it gives us the tools to, to tackle the complexity. So it's just a road to the solution, not the solution itself. That's the little asterisk. But for the other two, it was. A place of magic and wonder, the cloud. So um, our journey, journey to the cloud was actually like 2017, we started with some local research uh, on local hardware. Uh, we developed uh, a an, an machine learning model for invoices. Um, we had the first, like we had different models, one for header information, one for line items, because tables are very special and stuff like that. Um, then. Again, the same year, we already started to, to develop the whole stuff on Kubernetes because we, want, we knew we wanted to go there. The other startup was using the same as well. So yeah, we, we or at that point, we were still, I think, one startup. Um, so we, we went to Kubernetes and 2018, we started uh, with a search for a cloud partner. Um, but there was not very much choice on the Swiss market. If you wanted Kubernetes, uh, there, there wasn't like this big list of vendors delivering you Kubernetes uh, with a Swiss compliance zone, especially if you are a small startup with basically no money. I mean, we had money, but like you, you cannot spend it everywhere. Uh, there, were, there were vendors around which would go to the big banks and insurance companies and sell them Kubernetes in the cloud. Uh, uh, with a retainer of 200 person days just to set it up. So yeah, I mean, we, we could really afford that. Um, so we went with a smaller local vendor uh, first, but uh, we had a couple of hiccups. Uh, they weren't quite familiar with, with Kubernetes at the start and it wasn't just, so it, it wasn't quite working out. So um, 2000, in, in 2019, we migrated to the Google Cloud Platform Swiss Compliance Zone and my CTO said this, he actually looked it up. It was the 12th March of 2019. And he said, uh, he said that was the launch date or something. And he said, again, that we are probably one of the first G GCP customers to go live in Switzerland. So hooray. Um, and 2020 now, like uh, what you've just seen and what we will be launching in, in two to three months is our completely reworked platform where I will show you like uh, here we had a, a version one, like version zero, version one, and, and now we are going to our version two, where there's a lot of different things, a lot of learnings inside, and I will show it. Good. 
But sometimes you still need local computing power. So uh, this is actually an image from our office in Sissach. And there's like these two, two sick gaming racks. Like it's, it's really, it's, uh, each of these has a um, GeForce 1080 Ti, so the top-notch graphic card uh, two years ago in SLI mode. And I don't know what here, like Republic of Gamers. If, if you would look into our server room, you know, you would think someone's like really hard gaming then. And, and on these, like, I, I really like the setup. We even got this, this glass panel because it was cheaper in a bundle. And there's Linux on it, you know? Like, it's, it's so, I don't know. You can't game on that. It's for machine learning and for training around a little bit and, and having resources at hand, but ah, shame. So how are we set up? Um, uh, of course, we have a microservice architecture uh, for machine learning. Yeah, of course, we're using Python um, in the back end. For our front end that you've just seen, uh, we're using Angular. I has, have to point out, I don't know why, but it, we have a one-page application. Maybe that says someone something. Um, and for the back end, we are using Ruby. Um, Messaging, we have actually like three different products. We have RabbitMQ, Redis, and we also use uh, Google Cloud pops up at some points. Um, but the problem with this setup is that it's, it's too diverse and RabbitMQ is like, um, it, it needs a lot of maintenance and it's complicated and uh, we are actually on our way to, to maybe get rid of it um, and, and go fully Redis or Google Cloud pops up where it actually makes sense. Uh, the database uh, is a Postgres SQL. Uh, in the beginning, when we went with Google, we actually deployed the database ourselves in, in pods ourselves. Uh, but we quickly realized that it was way easier to, to actually use um, uh, Google Cloud SQL, is it called, I guess. So uh, today, even though it's a Postgres SQL, it's, it's also hosted with Google. And um, yeah, we're happy with it. As storage to like the storage you will see later, uh, also like a couple of functionality there. For one, we need to persist the documents that we receive. Uh, we need to persist different pre previews and like all kinds of stuff related around the document. But what I will show later and what's more important, we also need to persist all the data we need from the machine learning and uh, have a flexible way to to train and, and learn from, from this data. So we use Google Cloud Storage for that as well. Logging, monitoring, Google operations, machine learning training. We are currently on the path to migrating to Google AI platform to train there. Um, so currently, it, it's also uh, some pods, uh, base pods that, that are running there. And communication, we are working with HTTP re S requests. I should also put that in here, I don't know. I mean, I, I know how to, to get a REST re request and everything, but like, I hope someone said, oh, that's cool. Um, so um, what are we doing like with our microservices? Here are some, some basic examples for what we have actually workers in place. Like uh, we have a worker that does nothing else than generating previews take an image and scale it down, scale it up, um, scale it into formats that later on the machine learning workers or extraction workers can actually use. An OCR broker, which basically does, uh, you, in our platform, you can configure what kind of OCR engine you want to uh, use. Like we have a local one, Switzerland only. Uh, then we have one for EU only. And um, sometimes customers want us to use us on premise. We have a solution for that as well. If you're interested later, I, I could say one or two words to that as well. Now I'm saying that we are, we are not like, sometimes for banks and insurance companies, you need to have an on-premise solution. And we, yeah. So, and, and if they use it on-premise, we can't use our regular OCR engine because it's in the cloud. So for these customers, um, we can say, yeah, just use um, a Tesseract, a local Tesseract. Um, then, for example, a regex extraction. This, this has nothing to do with machine learning. This is like the, the most stupid extraction method there is. Look for a number with a certain regex and find it. But come on, if you need an IBAN 
And yeah, with regex, you can identify all the EBANs on the document. You can still use machine learning to see if it's the right EBAN, if the surroundings are correct and everything. But just to identify, is this text an EBAN? Yeah, use regex. And we also have key value workers. Look for word X, give me the, the word right of it. Stupid, but effective. And like very simple to set up and, and um, very good for customers. And you can, you can extract forms like, Static forms, if you have regex and key value most of the time, it, it's working. And yeah. So, but basically, like this, in the back, there's all, always like a, a base amount of these regex extraction or OCR brokers working. And if we get a lot of load, we just scale up. If all the work is done, we scale down again and go back to this base amount too. Yeah. So, what happens is if you upload a thousand documents, um, like in, in, in like 10 seconds, the first one will be uh, very fast processed. Then we need like two to five seconds to, to scale up. And then the rest will also again be processed very fast. Um, so yeah, if you have a, a synchronous use case where the user takes a smartphone picture and is actually wake, waiting for his, uh, for his result on his screen, two to five seconds, still too long. But yeah, we are, we're working uh, on that use case as well. Yeah, Deskewing, as I said, see if uh, scanners a lot of the time, especially the crappy multifunctional printers uh, you scan documents on, they, they have a slight skewing and you just need to deskew it. Yeah. Rotation control, as I said, also a couple of them. Uh, like behind these two, there's machine learning, but it's, it's not extraction machine learning or for classification, it's just something we had a couple of, of our employees, like a couple of days actually sitting there and drawing boxes on, on skewed documents. What is the right angle to automatically de-skew it? And now we have a model that, that does that for us. And then we have the machine learning extraction workers. Ah, yeah, like document in, values out. Like that's nothing standard about that that is absolutely not working we like all this you can scale up like this is basic stuff it's easy our machine learning extraction that's nothing easy is about that you remember the complexity about the different fields different document types etc like if you would start with just you know deploying this you would have for for each different field each different customer you would have your own machine learning or ml worker in the back consuming a lot of data and like this is just not going. So back to this challenge three, the complexity. How we started with our version one was basically, as I said, we created one machine learning model for invoices to get sender invoice, invoice number, total amounts. At that point, when we created that, we were thinking we will do invoices, maybe credit notes, like just three or four document types is enough until we realized we it's way cooler and, and there's a way better use case if we just extract every document type if we make it easy for the customer. So this approach works really, really well until a certain point and then it stops working well and then you need shit ton of data to, to, to get this uh, better and better and at, at some point we realized like that's not the right way. So it does not scale, it's too slow, we need too much data, um, it's not easy to combine like as I said, for a correspondence, you need the sender. For this, how did I call it? Eye color inspection report, you also need the sender. So if you would set up a, an, an own model for this, you would start training on a sender again, even though you already know how to get a sender based on invoices, delivery notes, correspondence, the place where the sender is sitting, the address, it's always the same. So yeah, why not do this? You create one model, per field or field type or field set that you want extracted. So this is the version two that I just showed you and that um, I will show you like, we, have, we don't have one model per document, but we have one model for the sender address, which can be reused in multiple document types. It makes it super easy for us to set up new document types to mix uh, Parashift standard stuff. So like the sender address is something that we are training for our customers. We are um, offering a full service where we have employees that actually do the data correction. Um, two reasons why we do this. One, it sells. Customers like it if they don't have, like if you start talking about extraction rates, 
we can extract your data 80% correct. You say 80% is cool, the customer says, yeah, but what about the other 20? And then you start a discussion about extraction rates and, you know, salespeople, they lie. <laughs> and you're sitting there and they say, yeah, your, your competitor promised me 95%. And I say, yeah, I could promise you that as well, but like, show me a, a nice sample of all your documents. Give me like five days of work. I'll compare it. I'll take the ground proof and then we'll see. And no one wants to pay for that. So it's better to sit in a sales call and say, yeah, but I can deliver 98% on field level. Yeah, how? Yeah, we have humans in the loop, like human in the loop, the next. Also AI. Now I, I said it like we have an AI document extraction, right? Marketing, hooray. Hooray, Mattia. <laughs> Um, where was I? Yeah, so we, we have this full validation option where we extract all the data and we learn, like the sender, document date, uh, document number, total amounts, we learn this kind of stuff, also the subject, but the customer can learn the eye color and the patient name himself because it's not interesting for us to make a global standard for this. Good. I'm, I'm nearly at the end. Uh, sorry, I talk too much. Um, business, yeah. Um, so uh, what you can see here, like we have the receiver and it highlights all the data that we need. And this extraction interface, it's not only to show me how good the machine performed, but it's also for the user to, um, for the user or us to, to tell the machine where it didn't perform as well. So the subject was only 88%. It stopped because it's yellow. I need to look at this and correct it. And what I can do is just, I can go on the document, mark it. And he says, wait, well, it's green, it's super. And he will remember the position where he found it. And all this data, where have you found it? What was the structure? What is the text? Uh, what's some layout like font and all this stuff we are saving in the background to this document to train this subject extractor on this kind of data. This one user interaction is the basis for all our training. And um, of course, an, a regex extractor, like we can't train it. It's, it's a regex, it's 100%, either it works or it doesn't. But uh, this machine learning stuff, yeah, actually good. Like this contract number here, uh, that's key value. Look for contract number, give it right. It just, you can show it nicely. It only has 93% because the OCR was maybe not as good. Um, yeah. So now the image you all have been waiting for and I'm dreading because I have no idea. So uh, what we are having is, is basically um, with Google Cloud Platform, uh, two Kubernetes clusters currently, uh, one for the platform where there's stuff like the user, uh, user interface, identification, backend, API, uh, the webhooks, uh, like all this kind of stuff. Then we have a second cluster just solely focused around the machine learning. And like there's no technical reason why we have two clusters it's more an organizational reason. Like uh, this is development, uh, backend and frontend, and, and this is our machine learning department. And uh, so, yeah, it's more organizational. It could also be one Kubernetes cluster, but well, we've set it up like that. Um, we, are, uh, we have GitLab as a code repository. Uh, all the changes are locked there, documented, et cetera. And we build our images in, in GitLab and push them to, to Google Cloud uh, Google Container Registry. Like not only the machine learning images, but all the images. But this picture more focus on, on how we do machine learning. Um, so as I said, we, we save the position, we save the text, we save all the data that the user entries inside of, of these uh, field or field type um, containers on a Google Cloud Storage. We have like folders here for images, models, metrics, ground truth, data, like all this machine learning stuff. And uh, so we save this, this ground truth here. And once we, either we have enough documents to, to warrant, warrant a retraining or we reached a certain number of documents, uh, the backend actually has like this, this little intelligence. If a, if a user starts with a new document type, he uploaded his first five, five are annotated, everything is well, he starts his first training to give the user quick results, something to look at. But if he has thousands of documents or fields in his training, he just does it once a day. And for our standards, we also use it once a day. But so this triggers like a, a new training 
our training orchestrator, we are going here more uh, to Google AI platform. He will uh, take the, the images from the Google container. He will fetch all the training data we saved over the day uh, inside of these fields, do his training magic, and send the new model back to the Google Cloud Storage. And tells the backend that uh, the, the new training was performed. And what we are then doing also is, is benchmarking. We are looking if the new model performs better than the old one. Uh, then we decide to keep it or we just yeah, throw it away. Or not throw it away, but don't publish it. And so in the machine learning, we have uh, currently we are using Google Cloud Run for, for these machine learning workers. Uh, again, they, they can be scaled up and everything. But the problem with Google Cloud Run here is that uh, you're limited to, to two gigs of uh, memory. And if you use machine learning, especially for our standard document types, we a lot of times we, we are above two gigabit, uh, gigabyte. And uh, yeah, so we're looking into migrating away from Google Cloud Run back to bare pods. Also, I don't know what bare pods are. I'm supposed to say that. Um, and what we are doing is like the, the newly trained model, we save it with a daemon set inside uh, of the, um, yeah, in here, <laughs> uh, the, the models on an SSD so that the machine learning worker is actually very generic. Like if this is a token type or an object detector or I don't know what. And if we now need uh, data extracted from a document, these workers just take the model from the field they should extract from the SSD, do the extraction work, and then are ready to, to, to do the next task. So we looked into deploying one dedicated machine learning pod or, or worker for, for each and every field. But if you think back like we want to scale big, if we have a 1,000 customer, each customer has 10 fields, that would mean like such a huge amount of Workers, we need to have running all the time because every customer could upload a document at any point in time. So we need a more generic solution. So these generic workers, which just take the model that they need, like the model are the ones where we have 10,000 models, but the worker just takes the model he needs, does his extraction, gives the data back, and yeah, finish that. And, and this is a solution where we, we worked like very closely together with, with Google also to to get something working here. Um, because, yeah, yeah, as again, this is the complexity and, and this held us up. Yes, that, that would be it. <laughs> Thanks for your time. And if you have any questions, I, I can try to answer them, but, or I could give them in total the end. Yeah, and if you are interested in document classification and extraction, Parashift. Good. When, when did you start the project with Cloud Run? Because Cloud Run is very young. So when you started, it was the November. Uh, last, yeah, 2019 in March November. 19. No, November. Uh, the Cloud to use Cloud Run for, for all of this, we, we started. Um, yeah, last November. November. Yeah, like the, the ground foundation for this version two was was late in November, and uh, everything you see here it was done since since then. Like the, the identification and um, a lot of yeah, like user interface and a lot of these identification, we reuse that from version one. Of course, we it's it's the same look and feel, and it's the same authentication. The webhooks are the same, but. Uh, for, for our new platform, what we did new is, is like this and yeah, of course, and on the front end, but like a lot of the stuff is, is, is kept. How do you convince your potential customers that their sensitive documents can go in? Um, like it, you, you have certain laws and regulations in place and you just need to, to know your way around it. and. Um, for example, if you have a Cloud Act, which is one of uh, the most cited ones, uh, as soon as your customers know that you're working with Google, they say, yeah, it's an American company and Cloud Act and stuff. 
um, you, you just need to have your arguments ready, like uh, they can't actually access the data. We encrypt everything down here. As soon as you are working with any American company, you are also under Cloud Act and, and stuff like that. So you have your basic uh, pro-con catalog ready. And if it gets too complicated, like we actually had discussions with, with one of our biggest clients, um, Actually, Google was kindly enough uh, to help us there out and, and, and go with us to the customer or uh, just talk to them directly and convince them to, to use it. So yeah. And for if, if you have banks and if you have Finma in Switzerland, like there, there's no reason to go into a Swiss compliance zone. Um, it, like they, they released something new, I think March or April or something. And yeah. And for um, uh, GDPR, uh, we have all this documentation ready. If you go parashift.io slash GDPR, you get our uh, data contract definition for the customer to fill out and our technical and organization measures and stuff like that. And you need to have this ready. Like you're not allowed to to waver if, if a question comes up. You need to have something ready so that you, you, you project confidence that you know how the topic works. We know how the topic works, but like as soon as you waver, you know, it, it but because the customers are unsure of themselves. And Cloud Act? Yeah, did you say Cloud Act in the first time you went to Yeah, it's it's from the US or yeah, if the US government, as soon as you are working with an American company or something, um, uh, the American government could um, try to access your data, which is stored by that American company. And it doesn't matter if it's actually outside the US or inside. And, like there's a lot of worries around that. If if your customer has problems with the US, that they are gonna want your data from, from us and so, yeah. How does um, your system uh, deal with uh, documents with diagrams or something like that? Does it not at all. <laughs> uh, yeah, at the moment, it's like uh, we, we tried a couple of models out to just detect pictures and detect these, these kind of graphics and so on. So I think we could fairly quickly write an extractor to tell you there's a graphic, but not like interpret the graphic, actually. Like we have the signature detection feature or plant where uh, it just tells you where it finds signature and stamps to, uh, we, we cannot tell you if a signature is correct or not, if it's valid or not, but we at least can tell you, hey, uh, most probably there's a signature or there's handwritten stuff on it. So there's a possibility that it could be something like that in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if, if we have this, if a customer comes to us and says he, he wants these diagrams, we, we look into it. A lot of the times we, we set up a small project together, proof of concept, we try it out. And then if we implement it, we don't implement it for that customer, but we rather, we, we write a new machine learning training or work or like a new extractor, which then is, is published for every other customer as well. So he could say, I want a new field of a type signature detection. And uh, so that's how you bring it forward and, and, and we don't want to make special stuff for, for everyone. Something else? Just a curiosity, but that machine that reads the paper letters that arrive in the morning, actually someone has to open the envelopes and put the papers in, right? Yeah, but there's so machines to open the envelopes. Ah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> like... I was expecting that. There's machines to open the envelopes, and there's also. Uh, I, I cannot imagine uh, because all, everybody folds the paper in a different way, you know. So yeah, the machine have really to expect everything. But there's also these ones. They are not for speed, but they you, you put the envelopes in here, and it cuts it, and it presents it here. The operator is sitting here, and it presents it already like open, so that you can just take it out. Wow, okay. uh, this is one touch. It, it's another scanning process. I had no imagination, something like this. Yeah, yeah, but that's a great <laughs> thing. Like, <laughs> also, that, that the, the scanning machines, they are really, really expensive. There's this magic machine that scans like hundreds of things, like 700 a minute or something. Yeah. But now there is actually a mistake. How would you find that? I mean, to, just to correct that. Is that the client's responsibility to 
kind of find the document and then give you guys feedback. So no, that's the wrong match or something. Uh, so the, the, the question was, uh, if you have these, these fast scanning uh, scanners, how to see if something was scanned not correctly? Like a lot of the time, uh, the, the physical process is open the envelopes automatically, take out the document, and on each document on the first page you put a barcode. And this barcode is used for separation, because, because then you can just you know, put the whole batch into these scan streets or into the scanner. And you, you scan 200 um, images, and in the end, um, it, it knows to separate by barcodes. But these barcodes are also used, they, they have a unique number on them most of the time. And later in the workflow, if someone says, this document is unreadable, it wasn't scanned very well, you can say, this number needs to be scanned again. And the, the guys scanning, they normally have a short time archive where they keep the physical paper for 15 days or 30 days to then rescan. This is not part of our platform, but just, you know, okay. free consulting. <laughs> no, sorry. Um, but like, there's a whole industry about this um, stuff. Any more questions? Yes, yes. And we try to set the, pro ah, the on-premise deployment, yeah. Um, so if we, if we deploy on-premise, we basically just deployed with pre-trained ML workers and um, like little model how they work each other. It's the same API. So if you would use our REST JSON API in the cloud, it's the same API on-premise so that customers can decide what they want to process in the cloud on-premise, but we charge extra. And we, uh, we try to set the price at a limit where like not many customers would actually want it and we were surprised how many actually wanted it even with this price and yeah so it's now something we we actually have to deal with and we have this this channel in slack with us where where you can just swear a little bit if you're upset about certain things and there's a lot of swears about this on-premise installation because as soon as you deploy on-premise of course it makes this a lot harder in the cloud because everything you develop you have to think how would it react on-premise we already tell our customers, you get, um, how is it, this, this Google crowd, not Kubernetes, like there's this other very easy to run, exp you just give them a SIP and they can run it. <laughs> Again, no idea. But we say you, you have to have a Kubernetes cluster, you have to look for it yourself. We give a little instruction, but still, um, until you have it once up and running, it's, it's quite a penny mess. But afterwards, there's like a script where we just can say, hey, he wants a new document type, and we export all this stuff, all the configuration in the back automatically into a zip, give it to a customer, he can deploy it. How do you find Kubernetes versus the Wrong guy, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I don't know, like, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, but like, I'm, I'm also in the dev channels and, and like we, we have um, out of our development team that was like one or two guys who, who do all the DevOps stuff. And we're actually searching for a full-time DevOps engineer to, to take this into the hand because for, for our normal backend guys, uh, like this is, or it's just too big of a topic to do it in parallel. Like UX, we also use search. We have front end developers, but we're also searching UX engineer because next topic where UX is too important to do it part time. More questions? Like, I don't have to speak. Uh, I'm, I'm gladly to. <laughs> no? Good? Okay. So, um, thanks again. If you want to reach out, you find me on LinkedIn. Um, no fancy Twitter, but LinkedIn. And um, or just drop me an email or go to parashef.io and yeah, thanks for your time.